thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm Max Welling and uh, indeed recently joined um, Microsoft Research and I'm going to talk about the things that we are going to plan to do um, in that lab and also in, in Cambridge and Beijing. Um, so in, in, I really enjoyed the last talk actually, the previous talk. Um, I'm going to be um, talking about deep learning and its successes. Um, and it's, it's interesting to see that there is, you know, two sort of application areas, one uh, trying to imitate human intelligence, and there's also something where deep learning shines, and in particular for uh, scientific um, applications. So deep learning sort of started in sort of its latest um, instantiation in around 2009, 2010, when a group uh, led by Jeff Hinton at that point um, sort of started to break records in speech recognition. So that uh, field was stagnant for a long time, didn't make a lot of progress. Um, and then uh, deep learning was reintroduced. Of course, it already existed, but it was reintroduced. Um, and it started to make a lot of progress again and beating records in competitions. Uh, the same thing happened in 2012, also by the same group uh, led by uh, Jeff Hinton. Uh, different students, though. Um, but uh, this was in the ImageNet challenge, and again, there was a competition and the errors were sort of halved uh, by introducing deep learning. We are seeing the same thing in natural language processing. The largest models these days have half a trillion parameters, so huge models. Um, and of course, more recently, protein folding, you've probably all seen it, uh, uh, DeepMind coming up with algorithms that can fold a protein just given its amino acid sequence. Um, and in all of these fields, it's fair to say that uh, deep learning is starting to disrupt these fields um, completely. Now, what are we interested in, in Microsoft and what are we going to study there? We are very interested in molecules. And molecules are really extremely fundamental objects, right? Because everything you can touch, um, basically, and, and also things that you cannot touch, maybe, um, are made of molecules. Now, there's a couple of things that are not made of molecules. Uh, in particular, the four fundamental forces of nature, electromagnetism, gravity, and two nuclear forces. Um, and also, you could argue that if you start to break, uh, destroy molecules, you get plasmas and quarks and leptons, so there's structure beneath it. But otherwise, molecules is about everything that you know about. And also, and, and the interesting thing about molecules is that we know the laws of physics, we know we understand them in a, on a theoretical level very, very precisely, um, but they're very hard to simulate, and I will go into more detail on that. Yet, if we are able to simulate them better, um, lots of really cool and important applications are starting to open up. For instance, in drug discovery, um, once we have uh, a better understanding of molecules, we can understand how you know, a drug might bind to a disease um, and we might neutralize the disease. Um, we might better understand how to turn light into energy and then store it into batteries. 20% uh, of all uh, energy is lost by friction. That's an interesting number. Um, so if we can build better lubricants uh, from understanding of molecules, we can reduce that number. Um, catalysts are very important, for instance, for hydrogen production or um, generating fuels from hydrogen and, and carbon. Um, and so the designing catalysts by understanding molecular dynamics better is also hugely impactful. Uh, feeding the world using fertilizers um, is also a very complicated process and if we, um, if called nitrogen fixation and, if, and it's also very polluting, we generate a lot of carbon uh, by making that and better uh, understanding molecules can also reduce the carbon emissions. And then finally, understanding sort of uh, life itself is also interesting. So what would we need to be able to do um, in order to make progress? Well, what did the other scientists do? Sciences do? Well, they built bigger telescopes and microscopes, right? So the biggest microscope, if you want, is the Large Hadron Collider that the physicists built. Um, you see a picture there, um, and they smash um, matter, you know, on proteins, let's say, or electrons on each other, and then, you know, fundamental particles come out. Uh, the astronomers build a huge radio telescope. Um, so this is a telescope distributed across multiple um, continents in South Africa and Australia and in Europe, and the signals are combined in order to, to basically 
form a huge, large telescope. So what would a chemical um, microscope look like, right? And our vision at Microsoft is it would look like a large computer. And the reason is that, you know, we want to simulate the processes in silico in a computer very accurately and in that way try to understand, you know, how certain processes work. Now, let me say a few words about deep learning and, and the technology itself because much of what we do um, is, is based on combining machine learning and deep learning with sort of chemistry and biology. Um, and the, ho the workhorse um, really is these convolutional neural networks and these graph neural networks. Um, so at the top here, um, you can see a convolutional neural network. Uh, this, it works on an image, but you know, we want to work on, on, on uh, clearly on uh, molecules. And it takes a little patch and it uh, sort of convolves it, moves it over the image, and it filters it and it creates a filter map. It creates many filter maps. And it does some non-linearity typically, and then often a pooling operation, and then it repeats that many times until you get a whole bunch of sort of small little images that, that are then flattened and then used to predict some, something that you like. Right? Now, we can think of a convolution basically as a message passing scheme. It's a, you have to sort of change your thinking about it a little bit, but here's sort of a, a, sort of a convolution um, sort of picked, picked, uh, illustrated. Um, you can think of it basically as the neighboring pixel sending messages to the central pixel and then adding, adding everything up and then pushing it through nonlinearity. And you can, this concept, this way of viewing it, you can actually generate to an arbitrary graph. Um, and that's called a graph neural network, and that is actually the workhorse for many of these uh, models that underlie um, the mo molecular modeling. Um, so deep learning has been successful in part uh, due to its scaling. So here you see uh, on a logarithmic scale the number of you know, flops that are being used in, in, in doing the computations, and here's time. And if you have a straight line, that's exponential growth. With the introduction of GPUs, the actual slope of the line changed, and uh, we are going to very, very large numbers here. So that's part of the, of the success story. Of course, the models are also getting better, but the scaling is part of, of the success. Um, okay, so what do we need to do? So what is our vision of actually using this deep learning, this tool, this microscope, um, in order to study molecules? Well, there's a good analogy with flight. So in the old days, when people built new airplanes, um, what they did was they um, tried something, they built something, they tried to fly it, and if it fell out of the sky, you know, change something and try again, right? Er trial and error, um, if you survived it. And then th the next step was, to build models, put them in a wind tunnel, and then measure lots of things around it, and then build models around that data that you collected, and then try to predict what would be good. And nowadays, people are building uh, airplanes completely in computers, completely in silico. And of course, if you do that, um, you need increasingly more compute power to do that. Now, for, for molecules, it's a little similar. You have a trial and error phase. You can just try a whole lot of things and then see what sticks. Um, you can do a whole lot of experiments and, you know, build models around those experiments and from this empirical data try to predict new properties. Or you can try to do everything ab initio, which means just simulate the fundamental laws of physics in a computer. And um, sort of our, our vision is that that's going to be the future. Um, so what are the, so the challenges that we need to tackle um, in this field? Um, so here are listed three. Uh, the first one is in, you know, quantum mechanics is basically the bottleneck in trying to get more accuracy. So we want to simulate the properties, let's say the ground, st the ground state energy of a, of, a, of a molecule. We want to be able to compute it. Unfortunately, you need quantum mechanics, uh, which is, uh, you know, very, very complex. Um, and, uh, and so we need to approximate it. So here's a, a, a sort of an example. So we have a, a, a molecule. There's all sorts of forces acting on the molecule. Um, in principle, the dynamics of, an, of a molecule is described by 17th century physics, the New Newton's laws, um, except for this little annoying term here, which is the force term, uh, which comes from the electrons. The electrons are moving around the, uh, the atoms, um, and those have to be described with um, quantum mechanics, and that's very, very hard. And so the opportunity here is to use machine learning to learn models to shortcut 
uh, quantum mechanics, to basically predict what quantum mechanics would have given you um, directly, and, and then you can do this dynamics much, much faster. So this, the second challenge is that if you want to actually model these atoms as, as they are moving, as they are wiggling around, um, that actually, that wiggling happens at the time scale of femtoseconds, 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And so if you really want to track that, uh, you're going to get nowhere. So you want to really, again, shortcut that, uh, that calculation and try to predict what that, what that movement would end up with, with a, with a big uh, sort of deep learning model, right? And so that's the opportunity here. Here you see the huge range of time scales um, that, that, that you would like to sort of uh, uh, model using uh, on molecules goes from 10 to the minus 15 to sort of one, one second, so 15 orders of magnitude, right? And th th therefore, molecular simulations is extremely slow. And so the opportunity here is to use machine learning to increase um, the integration steps um, in molecular dynamic simulations. And then finally, um, we also want to simulate much larger models, right? And so we don't want to look at 20 atoms or, or, or even 100 atoms. We want to look at hundreds of millions of atoms or billions of atoms. That's, you know, the number of atoms that are in a cell. Um, and here it's key to learn to coarse grain. So in order to, uh, to, to model a system with many, many atoms and, many, and even more electrons, what you need is basically to coarse grain it into many fewer um, sort of structures, and uh, people have be done that by hand, by being smart, but again, deep learning has an opportunity here in order to learn to coarse grain. Um, another interesting um, sort of holy grail, perhaps, um, is that um, wouldn't it be nice if you would tell me the type of molecule with the properties that you want, and I would then be able to generate that molecule completely automatically from a, uh, from a model. Right, um, so so there is these models that are called flows, normalizing flows, where you start with the distribution of points and you sort of shape it uh, iteratively to the distribution that you're actually interested in, and that's something that we can actually do now with molecules. So here is a paper um, that we wrote um, with these authors on it, um, where you basically start with a random set of points, you, uh, arbitrary um, atoms and then you flow this into a constellation which is a stable physical molecule, right? And then you can condition on properties. You could say, I want this molecule to have these properties. Um, and here you see a little video of that happening. And now we can do this actually for already pretty large molecules. We can do this already for molecules with the size of, um, you know, 20 or 30 atoms in them. And this field is very quickly progressing. We see massive improvements every conference, basically, and so that's a very promising direction as well as a big opportunity. And then the final topic that I'm very excited about um, is partial differential equations. Uh, much of the sciences is actually described by some kind of partial differential equation. It's basically if you have a causal system and, a, and it has local interactions, you can basically write a partial differential equation for it. And here's a whole bunch of examples of fields that describe their, their domain with a partial differential equation, like earthquakes, you know, heart dynamics, weather prediction, galaxy collisions, plasma physics, airplane design, electronic structure in the quantum mechanics and uh, tumor development, and many, many, many more, of course. This is just a bunch of examples. And what we have seen recently is um, that, you know, people, the, the, you know, uh, um, mathematicians have obviously derived very smart and intelligent um, uh, sort of algorithms to solve these PDE um, uh, so, uh, problems. But what you see is that you get a separate solver for every PDE. Um, and so the trick here is to say, well, what if we could actually learn, again, a big deep neural network model that could predict the solution that such a numerical solver would give, but then three orders of magnitude faster, right? Um, and, you know, here's an example of, you know, a graph neural network that was pretty successful, actually, in, in, in generating these solutions. So again, there's a huge opportunity for science in general. So, so the big picture then, the big vision, is that we really want to build a search engine for molecules. Um, and how would that work? So you, would, you could imagine um, that uh, you start with a query, there is some kind of smart agent, the agent would decide what kind of computations to do. It could engage a very 
um, sort of a cheap calculation to try to get, get a rough, rough answer, or it, or it could try to do a very expensive uh, calculation or even an experiment. And in the process of doing that, it would generate more and more data. It would store the data, and with that data, it would improve its models. It would also improve this agent, and this thing turns around and around and improves itself over time. And then the hope is, of course, that we can generate and, you know, on demand new materials with given properties. Um, so why um, is this an interesting area to go into? Um, I believe it's a huge opportunity uh, because of the following reasons. Um, there is a convergence of the science, like physics and computational chemistry and molecular biology, um, technology, uh, computational science, machine learning, and hopefully in 10 years or so, uh, quantum computing, which are relevant for these uh, problems. Um, and applications, which are an incredible pool to this, right? So for in healthcare, new um, drugs, uh, new vaccines, new antibiotics. Um, in energy, we, we have to make the energy transition. It's more clear than ever that we have to speed this up. Um, and in sustainability. Um, so perhaps what we're seeing is a, a sort of a golden age of designing new materials and chemicals and drugs on demand. Um, and uh, perhaps um, we can dream about a sort of a Cambrian explosion of new materials. We have named the eons of you know, humanity after our materials, right? The Iron Age and the Bronze Age and et cetera. Um, and so maybe we are now in an age where we can make any material on demand. So, um, um, as was already mentioned by the int introduction, we are starting a new research lab in Amsterdam, which complements the research lab in Cambridge. Um, and uh, also, of course, we're working together with lots of other labs, uh, among which also in Beijing. Uh, we are hiring um, new uh, s talent in those labs for the next couple of years. Um, we, have rec we have a booth here and we have recruiters um, to talk to you um, if you're interested in, in joining uh, this effort. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Max. Um, we have some questions from the audience, actually, Great. which I have the honor to relate to you. Uh, one question is about the, um, the scope of collaboration with other industry partners that would be warranted here, because obviously these are problems that are of huge potential impact, yep. and we've seen um, projects by competitor companies like Google, DeepMind, AlphaFold, and so on, um, so do you see any chance of forces being joined there or will the big companies all try to go on, an, on some sort of race for the moon or something like that? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I do know that uh, we do partner with other companies, right? So uh, we have a partnership with uh, Novartis and we're talking to other companies as well. But those are companies which have domain knowledge, uh, which is the knowledge that we don't have. And we try to seek out those companies um, that do have that domain knowledge. This is for us the most natural partnership. Um, I, I, I don't know about partnering with Google and Apple and, and Facebook. Um, who knows? I'm open to anything. We'll uh, note it down like that. Um, hark there was a question harking back to Melanie's talk. Um, do you think that human-like... So you, you focused on kind of the raw power of neural networks. Um, do you think that human-like abstraction capabilities could help in tasks such as molecular design and so on? Excellent question. Um, so I think the two domains are a bit different, and that's why I think if you're really chasing after building a, sort of a copy of a human, I really think you do need sort of this is a very flexible kind of um, intelligence where indeed you have to be able to learn from very few examples uh, and be able to generalize very broadly. Um, so these applications are not necessarily of that kind. So here we really um, th think of it as a much better signal processing tool, right? You have lots and lots of data, very raw, low-level data, and you're trying to build uh, sort of models that do well in prediction, in, in, in cert predicting certain properties. You don't necessarily need human-level abstractions to be able to do that. Now, having said that, um, this field might still be a little different than the field of uh, sort of maybe natural language processing 
and speech recognition where, th where just throwing more data at the problem really in increases the performance. Because in physics uh, and chemistry, you might not be able to generate that much data. And also, um, we know the laws of physics very accurately, where we might not know the laws of natural language very accurately. We, know, we think we know to some degree, but we probably don't know it all the way. But for physics, we know it almost all the way, right? And it's a bit, it's a bit sad to throw that knowledge away. And sometimes you have the right inductive biases, you just have to build it in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess we did see that, that humans can also do these kinds of tasks with folded and these games. Yeah. People for, so humans seem to have some sort of intuition about these things. Yeah, on, on the other hand, I challenge you to uh, take a molecule with, uh, you know, 5,000 atoms in it and try to predict, uh, you know, a microsecond into the future where all the atoms are. Yeah. It doesn't seem humans are very good at that. <laughs> okay. Um, so let me throw another uh, hardball at you. Um, aren't you afraid that AI can be misused to create bioweapons potentially of a disastrous kind? I'm very worried about that. But, uh, yeah, so... Um, any technology um, has, you know, positive sides and negative sides. It's, you know, I'm just trying to focus on the positive side, right? We, we do have a huge challenge, which is the climate challenge that is going to hit us. It's maybe already hitting, hitting us. And I think we need all hands on deck, including machine learning, to try to solve that problem. Now, obviously, the same type of technology can also be used for for very bad applications. Um, and yeah, it, it's, it's sort of in, in the nature of developing new technology. And I just hope that the politicians figure out a way to, not, to, to forbid you know, these, these types of weapons. Thank you. I think that's a nice capstone um, to, um, to close this part of the session. So let's thank Max again for this amazing talk. Thank you.